Hello, welcome to North Carolina Vietnam Veterans Incorporated's Lessons of Vietnam. My name is Bill Dixon. Uh, my co-host, Bob Matthews, is not with us tonight. We have a very special guest. I think you'll have a, a good time listening to what he has to say and his story. His name is Lonnie Connor. Uh, he's kind of new at this, uh, speaking about Vietnam and so forth. So uh, call in and ask him some questions. Be gentle. But uh, call in at 919-518-9773. It's your show. Uh, call in and ask questions. Uh, make comments. Be part of the show. Uh, give Lonnie a chance to uh, catch his breath sometimes. Uh, we've got a uh, special show with Lonnie. He was uh, in Air Force, and uh, we always tease the Air Force guys. They didn't get combat pay. They got inconvenience pay. But in Lonnie's situation, uh, he uh, he earned his combat pay and then some. This past weekend, by the way, was uh, August 10th was the uh, 50th anniversary of the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. The North Carolina Vietnam Veterans Incorporated and the uh, North Carolina State uh, Department of Veterans Affairs had a function where we uh, read the governor's proclamation in Thomasville, North Carolina at the... Um, Vietnam Memorial there, uh, because of the heavy rain and so forth that was, was supposed to be there, it was uh, not a great turnout, but uh, we were there, and we had the wall, and uh, the people who were there uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. It's kind of funny, the um, Gulf of Tonkin that started the war, now we've uh, found out that basically it was a lie. It didn't really happen the way it did. On uh, the South Vietnamese uh, military, along with the U.S. Uh, working together, the South Vietnamese went into the Gulf of Tonkin and uh, attacked two islands in August 2nd, I believe, 1964. And when the, uh, during the attack, uh, some uh, North Vietnamese uh, gunboats came out, and the, the uh, USS Maddox uh, saw that the uh, North Vietnamese gunboats were coming out. They actually left the Gulf of Tonkin to keep from having a uh, problem. And a few days, that was actually July 31st. Let me get my dates right. And then on August the 2nd, uh, the same thing happened, but this time uh, the Russian uh, patrol boats, or uh, PT boats, were coming in, and they actually fired uh, about four or five torpedoes at the, uh, at the Maddox. Uh, the Maddox uh, shot the boat up. Uh, it was actually two boats uh, for the North Vietnamese. They shot the boats up uh, pretty bad, and uh, they had called in from the Ticonderoga uh, F-18 uh, uh, Crusader, and one of the pilots of that was a gentleman by the name of Commander Stockdale. Uh, Commander Stockdale went in and shot up the boats and so forth and got rid of them. The Maddox uh, again pulled out of the Gulf of Tonkin, came back the, and a couple days later on August 4th. They came back and they'd heard that the uh, North Vietnamese were going to do some uh, aggressive maneuvers in the Gulf of Tonkin. So that night, as they were getting, getting about 10 o'clock, they uh, started to picking up uh, boats on, um, on their radar and so forth. Well, they fired like 154 five-inch shells. They fired like 120-some three-inch shells. They caught drip charges and so forth. And at the same time, they called in the uh, Navy guys, flight guys coming off the Taco Garanda. And actually, the only one that came up was, again, Commander Stockdale. And he spent about 90 minutes flying over the ships. And he kept saying, well, what are they shooting at? He never saw anything. He said, well, you know, I spent 90 minutes out there and they're shooting at themselves because there's nothing there. There's no enemy there. Even the captain later on of the Maddox started thinking, well, you know, this was a, a hoax that nothing happened because we have a sonar guy that got a little anxious and some of our equipment's not working properly. So it probably didn't really happen. Well, that information went to Washington anyway, and it seems that things got kind of blown out of hand. Robert McNamara uh, uh, told the President Johnson about all these attacks and so forth, and which led to the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which was actually uh, signed, I believe, the 7th of August, but and it was actually enacted by Congress, except for two, two men, uh, 
Senator Gruen and Senator, uh, uh, just had a senior moment, I uh, can't remember that, set other senators, uh, Morris, uh, descended of the uh, resolution, and three days later, which was August 10th, uh, President Johnson signed it. Later on, historians going back through realized that a lot of the information that was given to President Johnson was outright like lies. There was information that was there that was not given to him. So uh, even though McNamara was asked point blank uh, by the senators and in a press conference at the Pentagon, had the, uh, was the South Vietnamese did anything to uh, cause this going on, he denied it was not. So it all comes down to the Gulf of Tonkin itself as the reason for starting the war in Vietnam was uh, not exactly uh, full of truth. We probably would have ended up in Vietnam anyway. Uh, seven months later, after the date of the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, the uh, first group of Marines landed on Red Beach right outside of Da Nang, and the rest of it's history, all based on uh, uh, mistruths and uh, lost information, not supplied information. A lot of men on the wall, a lot of men and women on the wall as a result of uh, uh, some mistakes and some lies and so forth. Uh, we kind of suspended the Constitution with the Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, we got rid of the checks and bounds that uh, normally the president would have uh, based on the Constitution. It kind of got put to the wayside uh, during the Gulf of Con uh, uh, Tonkin resolution. Somewhat like our government today, I guess. But I'm going to start with our guest, Lonnie Connor. Uh, Lonnie, you were uh, you started out as a North Carolinian. Yeah. And uh, were lived in North Carolina for a little while, and then you moved up to Virginia. How long were you in Virginia? And tell us a little bit about your life there in Virginia. And well, I'm, I was born in Rockingham County, uh, but I didn't have much of a choice. My folks bought a farm up in Virginia when I was like one year old and moved there. And it's like a little out in the country, the closest little town was Martinsville, Virginia, in which I went to school, graduated from high school in Ridgeway in uh, uh, 1965, June 1965. And uh, kind of interesting, used to go to school and Martinsville Speedway was just a short ways from the school. and. In April and September, we'd sit in class, no air conditioning. Of course, the windows were open. We'd sit there, and when the cars came in and started running for the race, would <laughs> it's kind of hard to sit in your seat and uh, pay attention to what was going on. So Friday afternoon, time trials, most of the school people were over to Speedway, and it was just kind of the normal thing. But anyway, <laughs> it was a, a fun time living living there in, in the country and had a good time. What did your father farm? He farmed tobacco? Or? Yeah, we had everything. We had cows, hogs, chickens, tobacco, corn. You know, every, everybody did back then. It was kind mm -hmm. of the normal thing. Yeah. All right, so you graduated from high school. What did you do then besides farm? Oh, it was construction. Went to work for construction building. It was an oil company. It was working for a company we built service stations and stuff and I got injured and ended up just working at one of the service stations we built and then uh, in December I made the option uh, a friend of mine went to the recruiter and uh, took the entrance exams and so forth and I joined uh, the Air Force and uh, uh, was accepted and in March of 1966 I was on my way. Okay. Now, you, when you joined the Air Force, most people think of Air Force as airplanes and pilots and mechanics and so forth, but you joined a very uh, very special unit. Uh, tell us a little bit about the unit and what you had to go. You went through a basic. Where did you go to basic for the Air Force? Well, normally you'd go to Lackland Air Force Base, but it just so happened at the time I went in, they had a epidemic or outbreak of a spinal meningitis at Lackland. So they had a base in Amarillo, Texas that was had been pretty much shut down, but they sent us there just for basic training and then assigned us to different things. And I got somehow assigned to personnel, uh, which a country boy working behind a desk didn't suit too well. So about three months later, I was able to transfer 
into uh, trying to qualify to become a, a pararescue technician, and that started a process of training and testing and so forth. And then I entered the, what we call the pipeline uh, a few months later and uh, started the, the, the process of becoming a, a PJ, which is a, a term for pararescue technician. Now, this whole process, they have to teach you medical, that you have to be jump qualified, a little bit of everything. Tell us all, some of the qualifications that you had to go through, and I believe you told me it was about a year and a half training. Yeah, it's from the time you start to you finish, you, you, for, you go to schools, and it, the Airborne School was the first school at Fort Benning, Georgia, and you go through that, and, and then you know, every, every school is about three, four, five weeks, and you go through jump school, and then you go to survival school at, in Washington State and learn how it's air crew survival. You go, you go through that for a couple of weeks and then you have POW uh, training, which is very realistic. They did an excellent job of putting you through that for a couple of weeks. Then we went to scuba school uh, in uh, Key West, Florida, which was uh, at the time was SEAL Team East was running the, the school and uh, learn how, you know, how to scuba dive. You had to end up a lot, lot of swimming and uh, diving, and the last dive we did was like 120 foot to qualify. Uh, you go through hyperbaric chambers and the whole thing, trying to get tested for that. And then you started medical school, uh, and that's a pretty lengthy course. It, 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 you never, you never in, in pararescue, you never end your your medical training. You start it when you go to medical school, but even when you're on a team assigned somewhere, that's one of the biggest things you do is keep current with with what's going on in, with medical in the medical field, and keep you got to know what's in your medical kit, what your options are, and you just keep training constantly. And we. We went from there to a ranger uh, mountain climbing school in uh, Georgia. And at the time, I didn't even know Georgia had any mountains, but I found out pretty quick in Dahlonega, Georgia, they have some pretty sizable mountains. So went through that, and uh, that was real interesting. Then we went to Eglin Air Force Base, which was at the time was the home of the, the rescue school and uh, that's where we combined everything we'd learned up to that point as far as jumping, diving, medical, and put it all together and we call transition till we, we came out of came out of that about six months later. But it was a it was a long process. It sounds very similar to the process that uh, in the army the uh, the special forces guys went through uh, probably, I'm not certain, we hadn't talked about it, but probably not quite as much extensive weapon training as they go through. Uh, did you, you did you have to go through an extensive weapon thing? or Not extensive. We went through some, but not probably not as much. Now they do. The, the guys in, in the, it's called uh, combat rescue now, they, they go through a, quite a bit of extensive, they go through explosives and uh, demolition and weaponry and, and all of that not we didn't do it so much then we just had to learn it as we went well let's uh for our uh, viewers and so forth let's talk a little bit about uh before we get to vietnam let's talk about what your job was as a pair para rescue uh team member uh, i guess we need to get to vietnam for us <laughs> to talk about that but uh, uh what year when did you get to vietnam let's go that uh, way uh, 68 um, in like March or April 1968. So you got there just before Ted? Uh, right after Ted. I got That's there right, about January, two weeks. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess you did. Yeah. It was just a couple of weeks after Ted 1968. And uh, it was um, quite an experience. I knew we flew uh, out of Travis to uh, Anchorage or Elmendorf, Alaska, and then into. Uh, Yokota Air Base Japan and then on into Saigon 
and you get off the plane in Saigon and right off you, you see Vietnamese soldiers with a rifle slung over the shoulder holding hands with another soldier walking down the street and you think what's going on here <laughs> but uh, anyway it's just part of the deal it was part of their culture and they didn't think anything strange about it but um, it was kind of unusual yeah, you see, you see guys uh, walking down, holding hand in hand like that. It's, uh, uh, but you you never see a man and a woman uh, show any affection in public. Uh, but you see two women or two men, and it's not that they are uh, having a different lifestyle. It's just as part, like I said, it's part of their culture and so forth. All right, now you're in Saigon and uh, work. I know the Army went in through 90th replacement uh, out of Long Bend. Uh, what did the Air Force do when you got in country? Uh, were you shipped right out immediately, or was there some place that kept you there at, uh, I guess, Tonsonut Air Base uh, in Saigon? Tonsonut, we, we, I was controlled by 7th Air Force, which was headquartered in uh, uh, Tonsonut, mm -hmm. and just went and checked in with, with the office there, and they said, well, just go to base ops and tell them you need to ride to a catch a flight to Bentui and uh, they said well we got something going to Canto which is not too far away so just hop on the next plane and let's go well, we flew down to uh, Canto and called uh, our detachment at uh, Bentui and they flew a helicopter over picked me up and I was all set then so I believe Ben Tui was in the southern part of it's, South Vietnam down in, in the swamps in the, the Delta. Delta yeah right across the Mekong and Basse Rivers uh, we had a little base there. We controlled all of the, that was a, the furthest base in, furthest, southernmost base in the Delta, yeah. So not only did you have to worry about the bad guys, but you also had the leeches and mosquitoes, I guess. The, well, you didn't worry about them, they were just there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You wouldn't have need to worry about them. Well, let's talk a bit about that. Now you're in Vietnam and you're this highly trained, uh, uh, pararescue, almost a doctor. Uh, what was your what was your what was your de uh, job to do? Uh, we were kind of like a modern day EMS, something we had. Uh, of course, we had flight training almost every day. If we were on, we were on alert, forty eight on and twenty four off. We had what called primary alert, secondary off, and then we were off a day. So when you're on primary alert, you flew a lot of the time and just doing training and flight training and testing and hoisting up and down and uh, landings and takeoffs and all sorts of things like that. Same thing with secondary or on the second day. On the third day, you could do whatever you wanted to do, but mostly, like I said, when we were there, we were, we were training or just in the alert shack, and that's, you learn how to play a lot of pinochle and bridge and things like that, sitting around waiting for something to do, but now, I believe when you were off, though, you know, uh, so many times we see uh, all the bad things that the supposedly that the American soldier did in Vietnam, but uh, you did a lot of good stuff while you were there. I think you told me that you, uh, on your day off, uh, your one day off that you had, uh, that you worked in the emergency room, and uh, I guess you helped the local people as well as the military? We had a, a four-man team there at our in the rescue team detachment. At our in Bentui, when we were off duty, uh, we had a civilian hospital in Canto, which uh, treated any and everything that came in, and it was worked with our Air Force surgical team there. We actually ran the emergency room for them when we were there, and uh, first thing in the morning we go down and there'd be folks lined up outside with anything from a, a minor cut or something to limbs blown off and have shrapnel in them and arms and legs you know incapacitated broken and all shot up just you never knew what you were going to get i imagine you saw a lot of malaria and other strange diseases and... actually that we didn't treat stuff like that it's like uh most of the thing we treated was traumatic injuries mm -hmm. you know uh kind of funny we had a couple of guys from uh, life magazine came over and uh, 
they were gung ho reporters and they flew with us for a couple of days and took a lot of pictures and so forth and said, Oh, we're going to take pictures of your, uh, your thing at the hospital and we're going to have a big article in life magazine. So we did that and took them down with us the next morning to the hospital and, uh, came in and started treating or the, the patients as, as they were when they came in and said, where's, uh, where are the guys taking the pictures and stuff? Went out, <laughs> they were outside throwing up and, uh, you know, of course, you know, you can imagine it was the hot humidity, the stench and everything anyway. And it, they, it was more than they could handle. And we actually never saw the guys and never heard from them again. They just kind of disappeared. So, uh, but anyway, we, we did treat all sorts of things and it didn't make a difference who it was, male, female, uh, we treated them like anybody. And, and a lot of the kids were, were so small. I mean, their, their arms were about as big as your finger and it's all you could do to put a 22 gauge needle and give them an injection or something. But, we did the best we could. We treated a lot of orphans. We worked with the orphanage there, giving them uh, inoculations, and uh, it's quite uh, quite interesting. When you were uh, on uh, normal duty uh, as as a para uh, para rescue uh, during your forty eight hours on, what was the typical mission? You never knew. You a lot of times you'd have a a, a plane that had been shot down or crashed and you had to go in and of course when you went in you, of course you were automatically under fire when you went in because that's the reason the, we was down uh, you go in and make a combat approach and uh, now when you were flying a helicopter or were you an airplane helicopter always helicopter, helicopter. Uh, were you, was the helicopter armed or did you go in with armed helicopters with Ours, uh, escort the, the ones we used for the short missions were, were not we had uh armed here we had ar-15s and uh that's about that's about all we had in that the ones that flew the long missions out of thailand and up north had, were armed pretty heavy but we can get into that later mm -hmm. but once we once we flew we didn't have hardly anything we had a 38 revolver and a and a just a modified m16 which was a it was a short ar-15 and the flight, the uh, flight engineer was your guy that let you up and down on the hoist, and he would like provide cover for you when you were going down and coming back up. So, so the helicopter hovers, and they put you over to a cable, yep. and then lower you down to the ground with people shooting at you. Yep. And uh, that sounds kind of like uh, you know. If uh, we couldn't land a lot, I mean, most times we couldn't land there because it was so wet, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, down, down in that part of the Delta. And so you would go down and get the pilot or whoever, uh, treat them, and then uh, you and you and the injured person. Get uh, up and get out of there, yeah. Uh, back up on the, uh, now when they when you got back on the cable to go back up, did they uh, bring you back in the helicopter? Or did they fly off with you kind of hangling? No, it would get back in the helicopter. You would get all the way back in the helicopter. Mo support. Yeah, and would go take them to the uh, medevac center uh, and uh, had surgical teams and everything there it's kind of like a modern day mash that mm -hmm. you know that's that's where we took them back to then um now when you were going in like that to uh a crash site we'll say uh did you have people on the ground there to kind of uh, keep the bad guys away from you while you were trying to work on this person no or? no it was a so you were you were in the and in the, in the injured person was about about it yeah the biggest, the biggest thing we had in the Delta, the most missions we had in the Delta, we were right across the our base and a Navy uh, PBR base was real close to one another. River Division Five Fourteen on a river, and those guys uh, we worked with a lot, and they had thirty. The PBRs were like thirty-one foot fiberglass boats and they were used them for river patrol uh, going up and down it was, they'd run in a pair going up and down the river I think it was five or six guys on each boat and they were pretty heavily armed with 50 caliber 60 calibers and grenade launchers and so forth 
But when you're out in the middle of a river uh, with no cover, you're pretty much like a, <laughs> a bird sitting on a wire, and you got, you're just out there. So they'd get in a firefight and get shot up, and we'd have to go in and and pluck them off the boat or get them wherever they were. And we, that was probably 80% of our missions while we were there was working with the Navy. Yeah, those fiberglass hulls are not very good for bullet stopping. Nope. One of our members, Al Ely, who's uh, been on the show before, was uh, PBR. And he talks about how the uh, how the bullet just kind of went through from one side to the other and so forth. So uh, that had to be pretty intense, though, to go in and be lowered down with uh, things flying around you and and trying to concentrate on what you're doing and <laughs> and bad guys around you. And well, one of the one of the guys on the boats would get shot up if the boat was still operable we couldn't come in and hover over the boat because of the rotor wash it would wash it back and forth so we mm-hmm. had to go upstream run about 25 knots upstream and we'd come in and hover right over the deck of the boat and i'd go down or with the pj whoever it was would go down on the boat fix up whatever we could and then horse them back up while we were running mm-hmm. so it was pretty intense and uh, we'd actually go over uh at least once a month our crew and our uh, and go over with all the guys at the Navy base the procedures and so forth of how to how to do that when when they had a problem if they had a problem when they had a problem what to do and we became you know we just we were like hand in glove working with those guys there they were a great bunch of guys. Well, let's go back to the base that you were at. What kind of what kind of facilities there at the base? Uh, you. I, I guess it was hard to find enough uh, flat dry land to much put up a, much of a base down there. But uh, was it all Air Force there? Did you have uh, uh, Americans, Army, or uh, Vietnamese to kind of uh, also perimeter? Or did y'all have to look at the perimeter as well as uh, uh, do your normal stuff? It was pretty much all Air Force. We had uh, our little base, of course. We had a the Air Force, Navy had a, their construction group was called Seabees. Mm-hmm. Uh, Air Force construction group was called Red Horse, and they would go in and, and dig out and build a build a base. And we had a, I've got a picture of here if you can see it later on or whatever. Okay. But um, uh, it build a base, and it was about five miles around the base, and it was a total perimeter. It was controlled and patrolled every day and every night by. Uh, Air police that had canine dogs that were that they they watched they watched over us all the time, but it still didn't keep us. We got mortar attacks because the little the Vietnamese come up in the in the little canals there with the little sand pans and lob mortars in on of us like almost every day. It, of course, they did it at night, but uh, you know it was like a lot of a lot of stuff going on there. Did you ever get other than mortars? Did you ever get ground attacks uh, no. while you were there? No, so. no, and, and we're fortunate, I guess, in one way that we had the two rivers there, and up in the northern uh, provinces, uh, uh, regions one, two, and three, they could use rockets, but they couldn't get rockets across the river to us because it was so just the logistics of you know, heavy thing, getting them across the river and launching them. So but, I would imagine then that also with the two rivers and you in between, it was hard to mount much of a force uh, to get together, having to cross the river and so forth. Yeah. It would be very hard for them to uh, do much more than harassment of with the mortars and so forth. We handled, most everything we did was against the VC. It wasn't a uh, regular, mm-hmm. regular North Vietnamese Army. I don't think we ever had any. North Vietnamese troops that I don't know of down there was just all VC, but they were pretty intense, and they lasted a long time until we finally got a SEAL team that came in, and they started flicking them off pretty good, and <laughs> it didn't take but about three or four months, and our uh, numbers, our percentage of time of getting hit and so forth went drastically down because they were deathly afraid of those seals because they, they, they never could see them, never could hear them, and uh, they called them devils with a green face. 
and uh, helped us out a lot. Well, if you're uh, on the show and you want to call in and, and talk with uh, Lonnie, it's 919-518-9773. Uh, Lonnie, uh, going back on the base there. Whip is my question. Okay. Go ahead. And he says, what was your biggest regret about Vietnam? We have a question that uh, came in uh, on Skype, I guess, that uh, uh, was, what was your biggest regret? My biggest regret is as a medic, uh, it probably applies to a lot of medics and a lot of corn, is being in a situation where you do everything you can to try to help somebody that's wounded and you get them you know, patched up as best you can or get them in your helicopter and trying to get back and they die in your arms and you have no control over that. And I, it's, and I just think about that. I live that every day, every night, and uh, it's hard to deal with. And we have a caller. Uh, go ahead, caller. I'd like to ask a question to Lonnie and Bill, if you don't mind a double answer. Okay, go ahead. Um, being uh, the 50th anniversary of the Gulf of Tonkin and being Vietnam veterans, both of you, would you mind telling me and our audience tonight what is your biggest regret, if you have any regrets, about serving in Vietnam? Well, we just actually had that question. Uh, Lonnie answered it very well. Uh, looking back now, I'm not certain I had any regrets. Uh, I would have stayed home if anybody had uh, asked me. But, uh, uh, like I said, I joined the Army to uh, beat the draft and was promised a trip to Germany, which I still haven't gotten. But uh, uh, other other than listening to Recruiter, that's probably the only big regret I have. And uh, uh, Lonnie's regrets are somewhat like uh, I think most people who are in the medical profession is that you can't save everybody. Is that kind of what you're, Lonnie? That's um, you just feel like you can't do enough, and and what you're doing is inadequate sometimes. But you just like I said, you do all you can, and you have to deal with the suicides and the stuff that other guys just can't take it anymore and and that's that's hard too when you go get some pick up somebody that's committed suicide out of, they're out in the field and they commit suicide like what's up with this you know that's hard that's real hard to deal with well i do have one more question fellas if you have time for me all right go ahead okay um this is for lonnie and mr addiction you could chime in too if you like uh lonnie uh Fifty years ago, Vietnam, of course you were there, and I've been really enjoyed your story tonight. I'm sorry I missed your earlier answer. But what do you tell people when you meet them that are maybe in their 50s that have no idea about Vietnam? What happened? Why it happened? They're just totally ignorant about it. How do you handle that? I couldn't. Uh when you meet people who are in their 50s who did not live through the Viet, uh, Vietnam and so forth, who know nothing about Vietnam, how do, how do you, Lonnie Connor, uh, explain the whole Vietnam experience to them? Or do you try? Or, or just how do you handle people whose ignorance uh, about the whole Vietnam experience? I really don't unless I have found over the years that the people that brag about being in Vietnam and are all puffed up about it and everything were actually probably not even there. And the guys that were there and went through the trauma and the everyday normal stuff don't want to talk about it. So I've only been involved with a veterans group for about a year and a half here, and I've just actually been able to start talking about it. And uh, it's... Uh, it's something I'm I'm not gonna get on a bully pulpit on a stump and yell holler about, but it's it's real hard to get into, and I I don't I don't try to convince people what I did was right or wrong or justified. It was all a political thing, and uh, <laughs> like somebody said, peace is not profitable, and that's where our government uh, that's that's what that's what it was based on. Thank you, Carl. You have any more questions, or? Well, well, fellas, uh, I want to thank both of you for your service, and this country is certainly better off because of men like you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your call. Uh, You're welcome. 
call us back uh, with some more questions. Uh, Lonnie, go, let's go back to, I mentioned a while ago, we always teased the Air Force about getting inconvenience pay. Let's talk a little bit about that base. What, what, what did you have, uh, wooden barracks or quantum well, I've got a picture or, of it. Can I show that? Uh, yeah, uh, if you can, I might have to hold them up to the camera and see how they, how they come out, but uh, we'll try that and see how it works. While you while you're looking for that, uh, what did you uh, have hot meals every day or? Well, most times we did, but uh, mo if we wanted a good meal, we'd go across the street yeah. to the navy. Well, hold, hold it in front for your camera there. Okay, I don't know if you can see this uh, there. Let the most uh, Amnon there. Yeah. He can. The, the obviously the navy base is the one with the water front it and. Uh, our base was across the street, and we, we'd go a lot of times. We we wouldn't have anything much to eat. We'd get sea rations and MREs and stuff. Like I said, the Navy always had good stuff. We wanted good stuff. Well, they'd, they'd get resupplied off of ships that came into the South China Sea, mm -hmm. and uh, we'd go over and trade stuff to them and get what cases of steaks and so forth. But uh, it wasn't that bad. Well, when, other than getting mortared and being uh, work, and working and so forth, what did you do on your uh, other free time? What little free time you had? Uh, work out in the gym and just nothing. Read. Yeah. <laughs> gym. Okay, that was that was one of the perks that we didn't have in the army. So well, a, it wasn't really a gym. It was a, <laughs> it was a makeshift warehouse. Yeah. But we had just we had some weights and stuff. You know, we called it a gym. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, did y'all have uh, uh, the traveling USO shows come through or not there? I, I was in, uh, I got transferred a TDY up in country TDY up to, TDY temporary duty up to Phuket for about three or four months, and was fortunate or unfortunate enough to be there. But anyway, while I was there, the Bob Hope show came in. It was like right around Christmas of 1968. And, uh, of course, I got to meet uh, Bob and Ann Margaret, and uh, that was a highlight. And uh, Jimmy Stewart uh, and his wife, Gloria, uh, came down to our base in Bentui one time, and that was really neat meeting them. They were just super, super, super nice people. I think they lost a son in uh, Vietnam, so they were... They were special people. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go back to the mission. What was the longest mission you were on? Well, longest mission I was on was we were in Phuket. Uh, we had a what's called a command helicopter. Uh, Army helicopter got shot down. And, and the command helicopter is usually the one that's flying above the battle or whatever, so that the commander can. Uh, uh, kind of keep up with what what it tells men what to do and so forth. And it had like six guys on it, and I think the lowest ranking guy was a captain, was a, one of the pilots. And everybody else was either a major, lieutenant, colonel, or whatever. And it was a command control helicopter. Mm -hmm. Well, it got shot down, and it was probably thirty miles from our base in the Phuket. And we got first call on it, and we went in, and it was like maybe one or two o'clock in the afternoon. Of course, it's a, the terrain there was really steep. It's like mountains, and it crashed into the side of a mountain, and was actually nobody killed, but uh, they were three of them trapped inside the helicopter. So they let us down. It was like 150 feet down to it on a cable. Uh, let me and another uh, para paramedic down, and we started trying to extract the guys from the from the helicopter and uh, of course we, it had been shot down so it was a real unstable area so they brought in, we were working getting the guys out and we hoisted one of them out and uh, they, they were worried about our perimeter so they brought in like 30 guys, 30 army guys on a couple more helicopters or two or three helicopters that and they rappelled down uh, with rope, and they didn't know how far it was down. So when they got down there, we had to treat most of them for rope burns, yeah. and they weren't much 
good because I couldn't use their weapons after that. So we ended up getting most of them out back out of there. Finally, we called back to the base and they sent us a, a, a metal saw and we were able to extract the last couple of guys out of the helicopter. By this time, it's like 8, 9 o'clock at night. And we were getting the last guys out, and all the helicopters had been breaking down all day, and the last helicopter coming in to get the two of us left on the ground, they were hoisting one of the guys up. And just as the flight engineer reached out to grab the guy in the door, the cable snapped. Hmm. And... He couldn't talk because his helmet got twisted around to the side, and the pilot looked over the seat and saw what was going on. He actually crawled outside the helicopter on the ramp, and they held that guy outside the helicopter for about 15 miles so they got to a safe LZ. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, all the helicopters broke down, and we were left on the ground, just the two of us, and we'd already sent all our ammunition and everything up, we were there. I had a 38 and a AR-15 with one clip of uh, ammunition, and <laughs> my partner had not much more than that. But we had our K bars, and so, but we were there two, three, four hours just by ourselves. And at this time, you could hear everything moving. Everybody's coming in. You could hear them talking, and uh, they most, were, most of the uh, the bad guys. Yeah, they were all bad guys and they were coming in force and uh, all of a sudden we, well, we didn't have radio contact either I left that part out we lost, totally lost radio contact with everything the uh, C-130 that was in mission control over the whole mission ran low on fuel he had to go get fuel so we lost total radio control over everything and uh, all of a sudden we got radio contact back, and they said, we've got you. Pop a flare. And I said, there ain't no way I'm going to pop a flare because these guys are right on top of us here. He says, no, we know. We didn't know where you are, so we, we got you covered. And it was like a Huey and four Cobras popped up over the, over the mountain and uh, let, the, let the horse down, and we, they got us out of there. It was like, it was pretty traumatic, but... Uh, we 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 got back, and needless to say, it was a whole lot of whiskey waiting for us when we, when we got back yeah. to a safe safe area. But we were fortunate. We ended up having 18 uh, total combat saves that day, and it was uh, it was the biggest mission I was on the whole time I was there. 18, 18 saves. That's a uh, uh, pretty doggone impressive uh, thing. Uh, get it out, I'll find your picture uh, that you've got of yourself there in your <laughs> uniform. I want everybody to be able to see that. We'll try to hold it up again for people to see it. And then I'm going to ask you another question. This and, one? Uh, you talking about this one? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. That's part of our equipment that we had uh, while we were there. Uh, we, as, like I said, we had to airborne and scuba and everything. We jumped out of airplanes with full scuba and a medical kit and everything was there, and that was the biggest part of our thing is keeping keeping our medical kit current and knowing what all was there and exactly where it was. So, yeah, that's kind of funny. And uh, let's see, if I remember correctly, you've got uh, five uh, air medals. Yeah. And let's see, the uh, I'm going to get to the Superstar in a minute. What was the other medal? Distinguished the, Flying Cross. Distinguished Flying Cross. What what do you do to get the uh, to earn a distinguished flying cross? That, so that's <laughs> That was one we that went into a. It was a you know what a Chinook is it was CH forty seven. Mm-hmm. Was a, a down Chinook. We went into that one, and uh, of course, it, like the most any time we went in somewhere, the, it was already a hot zone because it had been shot down. We went in and landed. We landed in a. Rice paddy probably a hundred yards from my a hundred feet or so from the plane. It was on fire, and uh, had four guys that were yet to be picked up. And one guy started coming to me, and he got been a booby trap and had his leg blown off. And that I was, was that was as he was coming to us. To yeah, him. and I went to him, 
I was just hell bent. I didn't know all that was going on. And I went to him and uh, got him and another guy, and we made it back to our helicopter. I went back for the, another guy and brought him back in, but I didn't know until after all that was going on that he had been, his leg had been blown off by a booby. I thought it happened in the crash, mm -hmm. but it was a a mortar or a mine or something that he had stepped on. And uh, that was pretty mild. I mean, it was not much going on with that one. <laughs> it, it may have been mild to you, but it's still far from uh, You know, one of the greatest things we had, we had some of the greatest pilots in the world that, that just put personal safety in disregard a lot of times. We went into, it didn't make any difference what the mission was. If we had to get there, we got there. Mm -hmm. And they landed in, landed us in the most opportune place at the opportune time, so made our stay on the ground just as short as it could be, and uh, we saved a lot of people. Well, you know, from uh, from what you've told us before, just uh, not only uh, the pilots, but you as a, as a pair of rescue people went above, well above and beyond uh, what you would normally think of uh, asking a person to do, to be on the ground, trying to look after somebody and protect yourself and them uh, in, in a hostile situation and, and so forth. That uh, takes a very special man to go through that. And... Uh, we appreciate uh, what you did. I know the people that you saved uh, really appreciate it and so forth. Uh, you know, I'm going to try to get into uh, another thing. I, you also awarded the uh, Silver Star. Yeah. And uh, I know it's, a, it's somewhat of an emotional thing to you. Uh, if you want to talk about it, we'd like to hear about it, but I don't want to push you uh, to talk about something that you feel uncomfortable for. But uh, that's also a very special medal that not that not everybody over there gets. And uh, if you feel comfortable a little bit about, uh, without getting to a whole lot of details, uh, talk about it or just tell me, you, you know, you'd rather not. We'll keep right on going with something else. No, that was actually the mission I was talking about in Phuket, but it was just, it went on for so long. It was so much involved. I just hit the highlights mm -hmm. of it one while ago, but I really don't want to get into any more that's, depth that's, or detail. That's fine. Uh, listen, what you did was, uh, what you already talked about there was uh, it's phenomenal in itself. I can't imagine being on the ground uh, and, and all the good guys left and all you hear is the uh, is the bad guys you know out there. <laughs> and they probably pretty much knew where you were. They just weren't certain just how well armed you were uh, and so forth. But uh, just want everybody to know that uh, Lonnie does have a Civil Star uh, along with the other medals and so forth and he definitely earned that and a whole lot more. Uh, anything in particular that you want to talk about, about your uh, uh, tour there in Vietnam that I haven't asked you? We're going to go into something a little bit later, but I wanted to just kind of, what what about your tour that we hadn't talked about that you want to talk about? You worked in the emergency room. You did a lot of good there. You saved like that 18 that day. It's a uh, uh, pretty remarkable tour of duty in, in Vietnam. I mean, I, I, I was stationed with guys who never left the company area the whole year they were in Vietnam. I don't know how they did it, but they'd get up in the morning, go have breakfast, and then go sit in an office all day and come back that night and, and drink and uh, watch TV or go down to the NCO club where they had strip shows, uh, that sort of stuff. The entire the entire year they were in Vietnam, and here you were out there uh, constantly in danger, more than more than actually probably a lot of the, uh, the regular foot soldiers uh, in situations and so forth, that is remarkable. That uh, all the things you did and uh, you know, everybody, everybody in this country uh, owes you a debt of gratitude for all the work you did and so forth over there. And um, again, if you there's, some, you there's something about your tour in Vietnam you want to tell us about, uh, particularly that we kind of skipped over. I'll share one more photo with you. Just okay, just let's do for that. And this was a, one of the. This is some of the PBR boats. It's just for, hold them up there. And this is kind of like a tragedy of some of the things that happened in Vietnam. Yeah, PBR. That's Patrol Boat River. That's the, the <laughs> Army. Uh, it's called a River Patrol that, Boat. Uh, that was actually uh, the Navy had those, but they used to carry the Ninth Infantry guys with them, or they were kind of the taxi drivers for the uh, uh, Ninth Infantry guys. So forth, where they take them, uh, they take the infantry, ninth infantry, out to uh, different sites and so forth. Uh, the, the patrol boats themselves were Navy, and the Navy and the Army worked well there together. And it sounds like the Air Force, Navy, 
also work very well together. And uh, you have another photo that you want to show us. That's yeah, this is just some of our equipment that we use, and I wanted to, to go over a little bit of that. Had, uh, these are our four members of our team that was in the Delta. Uh, of course, I'm there, and one of my guys there is named Larry Nichols, and he's actually a bush pilot in Alaska now. And the other two guys, and I'm sure I'm not the only one that can, can say this about folks you were with in Vietnam, it was they got exposed to to drugs over there, uh, and it just kind of couldn't kick it, two of them, and uh, got back to the states and got kicked out of the kicked out of rescue, then kicked out of the air force, and both of them died an early death because of drugs. And I've seen it happen. It's like a, a fungus; it just attacks and takes over everything. It, it, it comes in contact with, and that, that happened to us. I mean, this is personal. So, Well, you know, with the situation, the job you did, the, the adrenaline had to be constantly flowing and so forth, and uh, even on days off, you had to be uh, uh, physically exhausted and mentally exhausted and so forth. Uh, when you got when you left Vietnam, how much time did you have uh, in the Air Force? What did they do with you when you got home? I... Uh was reassigned to Hamilton Air Force Base in California, San Rafael, California. And a uh, great place to be, except it was like 30 minutes north of San Francisco. And at that time, 1969, was a great time in some respects, but it was also the height of the, the uh, opposition to the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And one of the Center points of it was the Berkeley and uh, San Francisco area and all of Marin County and Cali Northern California. It wasn't pleasant when somebody, if you were off base, most everybody was nice as they could be, but you always had the group that wanted to do nasty things. And But we made it. Yeah. Let me ask you, how old were you, were you in Vietnam? I turned 21 years old a couple of days before I left. It's been my whole 21st year. I was 22 years old when I came back. You were 22 years old, but you were an old, <laughs> but you were a lot older old uh, as far as maturity and so forth. All right, how much? Uh, and you uh, did the rest of your tour there in California. Uh, yes, I did. And uh, you know, looking around and being back at a uh, stateside. Uh, situation when with what you left and so forth intense that you left how was it adjusting to stateside duty uh which is it's like the the army and so forth it's kind of uh well it's kind of uh, uh crazy with all the rules and regulations that you have to go through and salutes and uniforms and details and so forth when you just left uh, uh intense situation you were how, how do you go back and adjust to stateside duty after uh, spending a year in Vietnam as a parajumper. Did you work as a parajumper? Well, when, when, as PJs, we were pretty diversified. We worked helicopters primarily in Vietnam. When we came back, and of course, we trained the whole time with C-130s. That was our mother ship. It's a rescue C-130. And that's we did all our jumping from. At the time, most all our jumping was done from a C-130. And that's what we flew our missions, but we flew a lot of escort missions, a lot of rescues with C-130s, and uh, uh, it was just, we did a lot of escorts, like escorting helicopters to Hawaii, and and we did a lot of work with NASA. Uh, whenever they had a space shot, we trained constantly with NASA. Uh, we, when in the Gemini program, we would jump and put collars around the capsules, and then when I went to the Apollo program, we still were active. Anytime they had a shot, uh, a space shot, we'd go different places in the world and be on standby, have teams on standby all over the world in case they had a problem. You know, we were there close by to take care of it. And uh, luckily we never needed it with a Apollo, but we did. A couple of our guys got, got to put a, a real collar on one of the Gemini capsules 
that must have been an interesting uh, training and situation in there. Um, Working with NASA was really good. I mean, it was it was state of the art. I imagine, I imagine so. All right, uh, now you, uh, you you got out of the Air Force. Yeah. Uh, you did your uh, was it four years? Yeah. Four years. You're out of the Air Force. What did you do? What did you do with yourself then? You go back to Martinsville? Or? Yeah, I went back to Martinsville and back to small hometown. I thought, I thought that was the way to go, and started going to to school to call back to college and well, to college, mm -hmm. and uh, decided I'd be better off working. And uh, I started trucking, and off and on. I guess I've been doing that. Since then, since like 1970, I've been <laughs> one way or another involved in transportation. Mm -hmm. But I'm still still in transportation. When you were uh, Martinsville, being kind of the uh, little country uh, town, it is. It's not that little, but uh, uh, I, I don't think there was probably wasn't a whole lot of protests and so forth. How did the, how did people in Martinsville accept you coming back? Uh, were you the Hero coming back, and they just kind of ignore you, or is indifferent. I mean, yeah. the only people that even knew you were there were like your friends or whatever or the people you went to church with, and yeah. you know, you're welcome home. But uh, we got to work next week, so you know, back to the same old, same old. Yeah. So, uh, Mars was a great town. It used to be a lot of textile, a lot of industry mm -hmm. there, and furniture, and of course, you know what all happened to that. So. It's still a thriving little town, but not anywhere like it used to be. Of course, mm -hmm. North Carolina's like that too. Yeah. Uh, as you as you uh, came back and and started back to work, uh, the the emotions and intensity of Vietnam uh, kind of stayed with you. They did, but I thought it was just a normal thing. I thought everybody was like that, you know. Like, hey, you got you don't sleep at night. You wake up screaming. <laughs> Ah, uh, it's just a normal thing. So, I didn't I didn't realize that everybody didn't do that. And uh, you later you later got married. Yep. And uh, to a very nice lady. Yes, uh, she's very nice. Uh, very nice lady, and uh, y'all, you and and her both have uh, uh, helped out a lot of a lot of our functions, and uh, with uh, just pick, jumping in and and doing what else was necessary for setting up stuff and. Uh, some of our fundraisers and far, as well as I think we want to appreciate both of you for all your hard work with uh, NCBBI and look forward to many years of uh, working together, uh, getting, to, getting to know more of your story and so forth. Uh, I am uh, amazed at your story, uh, the intensity that that year had to be. Uh, appreciate all the things you did. And like I said, I, I noticed a lot of people out there, a lot of families out there today who have, uh, your efforts in Vietnam to uh, reason they're still still around and, and the kids and so forth. And again, I want to thank you for uh, all the things you've done over there and look forward to uh, working with you. And uh, just want to end it up. At just uh, our next show, by the way, is August twenty seventh. Uh, tune in. We're going to start a series on post traumatic stress. Uh, may get Lonnie back if he will come back and, and, and a little bit on that show and uh, that is a uh, interesting or totally uh, I, I think you could do six months of uh, post-traumatic stress uh, shell shock uh, battle fatigue uh, whatever they used to call it uh, it was kind of ignored until the Vietnam uh, process now almost everybody who goes to uh, service now gets uh, special treatment for post-traumatic stress when we came home, they were talking that you couldn't even mention such a thing, especially if you were a career military, because uh, it would ruin your career and so forth. But again, I want to thank you for uh, coming in with us thank today. Thank you for having Enjoy me. It. And uh, that's our show. tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, Health In with Debbie Brooke, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Lessons of Vietnam with NCVVI members, 
The Tanya Love Show. Reawaken your brilliance with Julie Seibert. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com. Sponsored by Atomus.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters for professionals. That vidblasterguy.com, carolinaapparel.com, and deltaforce.net. Thank you.